All right, living for Jesus in Laodicea. So, um, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with the church at Laodicea, and we're going to read that scripture a little ways in here, but it's pretty easy to, uh, to just fall into the trap of being Laodicea. You know, there's these churches, and when Jesus is talking to the churches in Revelation, and he's talking to them, and he's saying, you know, you do these things pretty good. There's a couple spots where he'll say, you know, you're doing pretty good in these areas, but you have these kind of massive glaring issues um, that we want to deal with. And so, uh, so we're going to just look at a few things today. But this last week, we went, some of us went down and we uh, uh, spoke at the Capitol on a, regarding an abortion bill. And um, I did a speech, and Scott did one, and Paul did one, and Ed did one, and, and, uh, and Naomi did one. Anybody else? Did I miss anybody? From our crowd. Yeah, there were other people. There were, yeah, yeah, there were other people in our church that didn't get to. But that this is uh, so there were a bunch of people to speak, which is really cool. That's a great thing that there were lots of people to speak. And I, I'd like you guys to know that um, that you guys go along. A lot of times when people think about these kind of issues, they think they got to have some kind of you know elaborate speech. You can literally just get up there and say, "I'm against this for this reason," and uh, you know sit down. It doesn't have to be. A, you don't have to be a great orator or anything else. Now, ironically. A lot of times when we go down there, we're speaking against what a lot of people call pro-life bills. So, um, because they're not really pro-life bills. They exist to provide political cover for supposable pro-life candidates who are just want to be able to say they vote pro-life. And the reason you know this is because there are bills out there that completely abolish abortion and they won't let them go, the chairman won't let them go to the floor. And the reason he won't let them go to the floor is because they don't want to be on record voting against a bill that ends abortion. So they try to block it out so they aren't in that moment. So, um, so anyway, anytime we talk about this kind of stuff, and, and here's the reason why pastors often don't, um, because it's uncomfortable, right? That's one of the reasons. One of them things that's uncomfortable. And another thing about it is in a group this size, there's no doubt people who have probably had abortions. We don't know. But, um, but the reality is we can't skirt around things that are real. I would guess that in this room, I personally and others have severe sins they committed in the past that when they hear about them, it brings them back to mind and causes us some pain. I have those. I hurt some people very badly when I was a young man. And I did it... Um, while claiming to be a believer and preaching the name of Jesus, and I did some horrible, blasphemous, and horrendous things. And when I see somebody else doing it or hear about them doing it, it hits me. But that's just how it works. Um, but we are living in Laodicea, right? And the harvest, the Bible tells the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few or distracted, or they just don't care, you know? That's, you know, one of those things that goes on. And there's another thing that just drives me crazy when we talk. It's not just abortion, but it's certainly one of the best examples, if not the best, People will say, oh, that's a political issue. And you go, wait a minute, you know? I mean, it's a moral issue. And many times moral issues overflow into political, this political scene, but they're moral issues. It's not, we're not going up there and, and arguing some obscure bill with some obscure language that nobody quite understands. We're talking about babies getting killed. So it's really pretty simple when it comes right down to it. But a lot of times the workers are few, they're distracted. And in, and in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And I would tell you one of the reasons why the Laodicean thing crops up is because we tend to become so engaged entangled with the affairs of this world that we can't really be engaged in that which God would have us to be engaged in. Um, and because we're just kind of wrapped up in, well, what most people are wrapped up in, carnality and greed and rebellion and self-focus and unhealthy independence where we think we're independent from the Lord or something and, and all of this, we're just fiercely this and that. And of course, we live in a time right now, you guys know, we live in a time when um, when it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of rights, um, you know, God-given stuff that is, is being taken away through various means and methods of control. Um, and so we should rightfully be concerned about that. But the, the rights that we should be the most concerned about are the rights of others. I see people get really fired up about what might affect their own rights. And, and again, not that that's wrong because there takes away, but, but the issue should really be more the rights of others. And there is no place where that is more obvious than in the right to life for unborn children. There's just no place where that's more obvious. It's the rights of others. And so, you know, there are people who can just get really, really fired up whenever you hear a rumor of a gun control bill. And I hate those too. I'm a gun guy. But 
it, abortion's been with us so long, it's just kind of like, you know, a, a wind passing behind our head or something. Everybody just assumes that, oh, okay, it's happening. It's just a part of the way things are, and there's nothing we can do about that. That's not true. But we become entangled in the affairs of this life. Now, things have changed a lot, guys. I think you noticed that. Just in culture and society. You know, people used to work for responsibility and family, and now people mostly work to get that next thing, whatever that thing is that they want to get. They're, they're, that's the thing that motivates them rather than just responsibility, family, those kind of things. And there's a wild search for fulfillment outside of the things that the Lord said would bring true fulfillment. I mean, there's so much that God has given us in terms of family and, and, uh, and ministry and brother and sisterhood in the Lord, all of this stuff, and yet we often are seeking for fulfillment outside of the things that God has said bring fulfillment. You know, one of the the thing that brings the most fulfillment in life is knowing and serving Christ. I mean, it's just it. That's the whole, that's where completion is found. And you guys know me. I like fun stuff. I have fun stuff. That's not about that. It's about the fact is whether that thing owns you or what, and whether or not the most important thing in your life is actually serving Jesus. You know, and, and honestly, I, those of you that have been believers for any time at all, is there any time in your life when you're happier than when you know you're just right in the center of God's will? Man, there's no time like that in life. There's just, there's just, that's the best thing in the world, just to sit there and know, man, I am in God's will. And if you're part of the uh, kind of worldly religious set that says that you can never be satisfied or anything else because that wouldn't be holy, um, you can be, actually. You can, you can know that you are saved. You can know that you're walking with the Lord. You can know that you are His. You can know that you're serving Him. Um, and you can take joy in that yep. and just go, you know what? It's a great day. I am spending time with the Lord today and it's wonderful. You know, I don't have to second guess that or spin it all around. I just want to press in deeper with the Lord. But all of this stuff, there's so many battles that the devil wins along the way just in our lives. Things that just, just uh, so it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't surprise us that the world chases after the wrong things. But man, God's people, <laughs> you know, really shouldn't be chasing after the same thing as the world. You know, the world legitimately can ask, well, how are you guys any different than anybody else? And usually we say something like, well, we believe in Jesus and that's cool, but... We should be different besides that, right? I mean, different priorities, different motives, different things that make us get up in the morning or whatever else, and, and it's just too easy to get sucked into the flood. Peer pressure. Now, I guess you guys probably know about peer pressure. I always think it's funny because people think that's a teenage thing. <laughs> that is not, not, it's worse when you're older. I know, I know some of you guys have heard me say this before, but it is worse when you're older. It just gets covered up a little bit better. A lot of times teenagers are rebellious enough to still do their own thing, but uh, typically, I think that the adult is more worried about what the neighbor thinks about their kid than the kid is about what the neighbor kid thinks about them. Um, you know, it's, it's just like, oh, you've got to go make us look good. You know, a lot of pastors do that to their kids, and it really messes things up. It's like, okay, I know you're just a horrible child, but when we go to church, can you pretend to be good? You know, um, you know I'm the pastor, and, and otherwise you're going to make me look bad. Um, so just go in there and, you know, raise your hand when you sing and stuff, and everything will be cool. No, it isn't quite that blatant usually, but it, it, there is this, this idea. Idea that uh, that you know God doesn't have it for us to be really really different, and a lot of times I say that the parents it's like when a kid watches the parents fight all the way to church service, and they're just you know calling each other names and going crazy and all that, and then they walk in the door and they see somebody and go hey bless the Lord how are you and shake their hand, I mean of course the kid's just going what is wrong with you, you know. I mean, it's just, we have to think, we're supposed to actually be different. It's, these are not just things we talk about. They're supposed to be things we actually live out. Not, the Bible is actually not a book of things that God can do. It's a book of things that God will do if we'll actually be obedient to him. Um, you know, if we'll actually follow him. It's a, it's a book of what he will do. If you look at the promises of scripture, very often they're covenant promises. They say, if you do this, I'll do this. Yeah. If, you, if you will go, and, and you know, the Lord didn't need them to go down and stick a staff in the water to part the, part the river, but they wanted to be obedient. It wasn't a magic staff. It was obedience to the Lord. So they went down, and then he does what he does. If we, just, if we have this, God does bless obedience. And I always say this over and over again. It's been twisted in our world to be like, you know, if you, if you give 5,000 to the church, you'll get 50,000 back or something like that. But that's been twisted. But God does want to bless his people. It's just we don't define what a blessing is. He defines what a blessing is. Man. Um, so if you want to pull up that next slide, just simply says, you do not have to be like everyone else. This is a revelation, okay? 
This is a revelation. This world's trying to make everybody into a clone, man. I mean, it's just like, and sometimes the church tries to make everybody into a clone. We're very different people. We are. And we need to learn to appreciate differences. We don't appreciate differences so much now we medicate them. Um, uh, we just want everybody to kind of be a zombie, right? And just kind of go through life and just say, you know what? We are different people. You know, I think I was a, a pretty decent kid into that. Back when I was, you know, Lord uh, saved me when I was 15. And, but I'd still go into that Sunday service and there's some girl in pigtails in front of me. I had to pull that. There was just no way around it. And, and you know, to this day, I still sit there and think, ah, just about kills me not to just pull somebody's hair. Sue knows I'll pull her hair. Um, and uh, just like, it's just, it's just something in there. And okay, so I, I managed to curb that enthusiasm, but still, it's like, I'm a different kind of person. My brain goes 25,000 different ways and at the same time, and I can't do one thing at a time, but I can do a lot of things at a time. And, and if I try to do one thing at a time, I'll just stare at it forever. Uh, I have to have a whole bunch of things going, and that makes me seem like kind of a scattered person, which I kind of am. But eventually, those projects get done. They just get done a little bit at a time. Yeah. So a uh, just different way. See, she understands me, um, but it's just, it's just a different sort of way. But I was taught, as my, as my parents taught me early on, they said, no, you're, this, is a, this is a gift, not a curse. I mean, just I'm off the scale on the ADHD thing. And, uh, and it's just like, it's a gift, not a curse. Great. It's awesome. So, but I want to ask you this question. What is normal? So set it on a dryer. Yeah, we ask, what is normal? You know, it's really an interesting question because, you know, you might look at somebody and go, oh, they're pretty normal, you know, and I got to, I got let you know something. Some people act normal, but they're not normal. It's all rel it's all relative. They're not normal. It's just like, they're not normal. And, and normal does not mean right. Correct. Normal does not mean that it's the right way to be. Right. Normal is just what most of the people are doing. Yeah. Among a tribe of cannibals, it's normal to eat people. And so this idea of normal is just what most of the people are doing. And we've got to get out of that because we tend to accept things because they become normal. If they're around long enough, they become normal. And we start thinking, hey, that's normal. And yet the Bible says in Psalm 12, 8, it says, the wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Now that is a powerful scripture. Because if you relate that to our time and place right now, our culture, it is just there. Vileness is not just accepted. It is exalted. It's lifted up. It's somehow better than being what we might call normal. Because you can be abnormal in all kinds of horribly sinful ways, and that's exalted. But if you're abnormal in some way that isn't sinful, that's not acceptable. It's a weird time that we live in, guys. And we've got to figure out we're not going to fit in. We're not going to fit into that. The world... You know, we often look at this next scripture. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. And we often think about it in terms of relationships, and that's accurate, like marriage relationships or dating relationships or whatever else, when it says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But it actually isn't talking about relationships. It applies to that. Certainly it applies big time to something like who you're going to marry or anything like that, whether or not they're not a believer or anything like that. But it's talking about intermixing with the world in general is what the scripture is saying. So he goes, he says in 14, be ye not in unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness and what concord has Christ with Belial or what part hath he, take, hath he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and, and walk with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That word be separate doesn't mean we don't talk to people. <laughs> it doesn't mean we don't, you know, go to work and there's some unbeliever around us. It does mean that I probably wouldn't enter into a business relationship with an unbeliever. Um, it, there's a lot of ways that we can be unequally yoked. It means that I probably won't join in activities that are worldly with an unbeliever. And it, so there is this reality of just being separate, but being separate, that word primarily means be different. <laughs> be different. It doesn't necessarily mean we go build a commune and only have our people live out there in the desert in our, behind our walled city. Um, it means, because God wants us to go out there and share the gospel, he wants us to be out there and involved, right? But he doesn't want us to be yoked with that. 
It doesn't want us to be connected, entangled. Those words come up again, entangled, connected, entangled with the affairs of this life. Uh, part of it. Don't be part of it. Don't be part of it. Do not play games with the world. And that you know, applies to so many things. So I wonder how separate we are, really, because what's happened in our current time is that you know, the, the church through this generation has been mostly trying through church growth things to become as much like the world as they can so maybe we can meet them halfway and they'll come and they'll be part of us, right? And so let's just try to, you know, if we get the right stuff and the right things going and everything's polished and really works good, folks, we gotta go back to believing that Jesus transforms lives. That is the absolute bottom line of all of this, that it isn't about, you know, whether a string on my guitar breaks or whatever. It is about whether the Spirit of God is moving among a group of people. And if the Spirit of God is moving among a group of people, awesome things are gonna happen. Awesome things. But that comes down to the Lord. Now, so I ask, you know, how separate we are. I mean, I mean there's a reason, okay, uncomfortable things. Nowadays, you know, we don't wanna preach, the other reason we don't wanna do un speak uncomfortable things is because it runs people off. Years ago, I used to be probably a, preach a little more uh, bluntly than I do now. Um, in the early years, I, I preached pretty bluntly. And, you know, people got upset. And after a while, you get tired of fighting those battles, so maybe it, you know, round off the edges a little bit when you shouldn't. But, um, but I remember this lady came years ago, and she came up to me and said, if you keep preaching this stuff, we're never going to have a big church. <laughs> and I, I just said, you know, the goal is not to have a big church. It's to speak the truth, okay? It's, and then, you know, we, we want people. That's great. You know, we count people because people count. That's what I would say. But it's not, you know, there's a reason why Joel Osteen is successful, you know, in a world sense, because he doesn't say uncomfortable things. He just says things that make you feel wonderful about yourself. So I can do that every week and come in here and tell you how wonderful you are, and probably you'll keep coming back for a while. Some of you, the rest of you will go, I want to find a church where they preach the word. Um, you know, so you can't win. So I'm going to go with the word. And um, anyway, to be separate. And it says here in Revelation 3, 13 through 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou might be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou might see, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he will to, with, with me." To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know that uh, I stand at the door and knock scripture is used in a lot of salvation tracks. And he wasn't talking, he was talking to the church. That's the thing, he's talking to the church. He's not, I mean, you could use it to some application in a salvation presentation, but he's talking to the church. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I think maybe the Lord is standing at the door knocking of a, a lot of church bodies yes. and going, you know what? Open the door and I'll come in. Open the door. I stand at the door and knock. But it's not Jesus coming in through the door to do things on our terms. You know? This is about us learning to do things on his terms. To change the expectation where we're not just, you know, um, coming, you know, like this, this, this is, uh, we come in here for a campfire Sunday and we think it's kind of fun and it's, it's, it is, it's enjoyable and I like to change things up some. But the first time we did it, people were really weirded out. They're just like, what in the world is happening? I remember years ago when we, were, we had done a wedding or something in here, and so we had all the tables set up everywhere. Maybe it was a Christmas dinner or something along that line. And we had all the tables set up, and we were tired. And in those days, we used to just have all the chairs set up, like, you know, anywhere else you go. And, but I said, you know, we're tired. Let's just leave the tables up for tomorrow morning, for Sunday morning, and, and we'll just do that. And people came in, and so many of them just stood right there in that corner because they couldn't figure out where they were supposed to go sit. <laughs> uh, and they just sat there looking around and then they were going, is it, is it like a birthday party? Is it like, what's happening? Because it, it, it threw their whole world 
that we had tables out instead of chairs. That was enough to rock their world, right? Well, there's something weird in the church when that's enough to rock your world, you know. And then the time I've shared with you before about the time I had a pinata up here. And everybody's going, somebody's birthday? What's going on? And then partway through the message, I had the kids come up and smack the pinata and everything else. And I said, everybody out there sitting there thinking, why a pinata? And I said, it's the wrong question. We get the right, wrong answers, so we ask the wrong questions. The right question is, why not a pinata? It's the right question. I mean, because this stuff that we do, this, you know, it's not wrong, but, you know, to meet at 1030 or whatever and, and have a Sunday morning service, a lot of places have Sunday night services too. In fact, when a lot of places stopped having Sunday night services, a lot of people say, thought they weren't the true church anymore. Um, because somewhere that has to be in the Bible, right? Somewhere in the Bible it says at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings you're supposed to meet. And, uh, and somewhere in there it says, thou shalt sing some songs and then uh, thou shalt usually take an offering. We don't do that. But, but, and then thou shalt preach for a certain amount of time and thou shalt be done by noon. Um, and, uh, and I mean, that somewhere it says that in the Bible. And then thou shalt go home for a little while, take a nap, come back and do the whole thing over again if you have Sunday nights. Well, none of this stuff is in Scripture anywhere. Now, the Sunday is the first day of the week, which it says on the first day of the week, the believers would gather to worship the Lord. There's, there's a connection there. But how we do that, there's nothing in there that defines that. But we tend to make things sacred that are not sacred, and we end up making rituals and routines that just aren't in Scripture. And when somebody looks at us and says, where's that in the Bible? And we go, eh, it's not actually there, right? But again, it's not wrong. It's not wrong that we're here at this time in this place. It's just not sacred. It's not written down somewhere. So we should ask ourselves why we do what we do, because otherwise we just become a part of the culture. We just kind of go through the motions, do what we do, and we don't ask the question. Remember, we've talked many times about how churches are like the only organization in the world that never analyzes itself by its bottom line. You know, we have a bottom line, and that's salvation, discipleship, helping the hurting and the needy, standing up for uh, unborn babies, things like that. We have, we have a bottom line. We can ask, okay, are we accomplishing this mission? And in a business, because, you know, my family, I came up in business, grew up in business, and, um, and if that business didn't make money for th three years, we'd probably sit down and reevaluate what we're doing. But if the church isn't fulfilling its bottom line, it almost never sits down and says what needs to change. It just keeps going because success, the, what we call success, that bar just keeps going lower and lower and lower and lower until what it really is in most church groups is, hey, in this past year, we made the budget and we didn't have a whole lot of big problems. And that's the, the line of success. And we go, we succeeded another, oh, and we have, you know, we're, we grew 10% this year. So we have, you know, we have a few more people. And we picked up some good tithers. Next year ought to even be good better, you know? It's got to be higher than that. It's got to be about people getting saved and people getting trained up. And it's got to be about um, bind up the brokenhearted, release the captives from the prison. The, uh, and where could that be more obvious than in standing up for the unborn? And that is, uh, but a lot of people go, oh, no, that's a political thing. It's not my thing. It's a political thing. It's a political thing. It's amazing. Anyway, the influence on our culture is so powerful. It's so powerful that, you know, I'm using that abortion thing because I'm trying to do a little bit of two things here, but it's also a good example of how we can just become so used to something that it doesn't appall us anymore. It doesn't just make us go, because if you really think about what's happening there, and you know, the murder of babies, they rip you to shreds. They're ripping them to shreds. That's the real life thing that's happening, but that's uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about that, right? But what could be more straightforward and what could be more simple? And yet, and you guys know I hate things like mask mandates. You know what? But honestly, when people can get more upset about a mask mandate than they are about the fact that babies are being killed, there's a real problem. <laughs> and it's happening all the time. It's like, oh, they're not going to tell me I can wear a mask. Well, they're not going to tell me I have to wear a mask either. But the reality is there's a lot of passion about that and not much passion about the fact that babies are being chopped into pieces. And that means something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong. Again, nothing wrong with being against stupid things that people do and stupid laws and rules that the government makes. But what really invokes our passion? The things that affect us personally and to even think about those things that don't really, I mean, they're, yeah, like, yeah. Um, People just think that's just happening out there. It's just a part of life. And so what do they do? They, they keep, 48 years now, 
been writing, pro-life organizations have been making pro-life bills, and where are we? Somewhere, people have to start asking the question. Remember, bottom line? Bottom line is to stop abortion should be of a pro-life group, and yet it's just a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors. We should just be absolutely against abortion. I'm going to read the speech that I gave uh, last week here. And um, maybe one of these days we'll get these guys to give theirs too. But I just wanted to, I think the speech probably gives you an idea of what I think is the problem here. But you guys know this part. My name is Benji Graves and I've pastored Vision Community Church in Marsing for the last 22 years. And in regard to House Bill 220, I'd like to state that this is either a baby or it's not. If we agree that it's a baby inside the mother, then there's never a time when it's okay to kill it. And frankly, it is a baby, and it is that simple. The problem with HB 220 is like so many pro-life bills, it's not actually a pro-life bill. It's pro-life in some circumstances. And I would guess that even abortionists are pro-life in some circumstances, maybe with their grandchildren. We should not take comfort in being more pro-life than the abortionists. God is offended by compromise. The bill says that it's allowable to murder babies in some conditions and even allows for state funding in several cases. My friends, babies conceived in rape are just as real and as innocent as any other. And the bill even allows for state distribution of drugs to kill babies through state agencies. It allows for the funding of hospitals to commit the murder of innocent children. This is a pro-life bill, guys. I am here today out of a sincere desire to save these children, but I'm also here because I do not want to stand before God one day and give an account for why I did not stand absolutely against the murder of his creation in any, any and every case. I do not want to stand before the Lord with blood on my hands. I encourage you to vote against House Bill 220 and to strongly support bills that abolish abortion entirely. May the blood of the children not be on the hands of Idaho and its people. This bill may have been created with good intentions and be based in political pragmatics, but Gideon was able to do more with less because God was with him. God is not with compromise that allows for these horrific crimes against the most innocent members of our society. And you might be thinking if you stand for complete abolition of abortion, it just won't pass. But please consider the word of the Lord in Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He asks only that we be obedient, regardless of the personal cost, and make no mistake, any allowance for the murder of these innocent children is an abomination to God. Amen. You know, right now we have a man who claims to be a believer, and he is uh, the chairman of a committee. That they, We have a bill. There's a bill to abolish abortion. Um, it's there, but he has refused to hear it. So everybody email Brent Crane and say, hear bills about abolishing abortion. Seriously, email the guy. He claims to be a believer. Um, and so just, uh, just say, you know what? Just hear the bill. What's the harm in hearing the bill? It's just, it really is that simple. Well, again, the reason they don't want to hear the bill is because there's a whole bunch of supposedly Republican pro-life legislators who don't want to have to be on the record voting against a bill that stops abortion. So they don't want that on the record. Now, we want that on the record. So, uh, so we want to get that in there. And is that 56? 56, House Bill 56, yeah. yeah. And you can also say AHRA, which is the Abortion Human Rights Act, um, AHRA, and, uh, but they just won't even hear it, and that's why. It's purely political. Did you send um, so. out an email with his address? I will send out an email with his address and the numbers of the bills. So that'll do it. So anyway, because honestly, guys, it, it really is that simple. And if we can get fired up about the fact that, you know, they're making us wear a mask, which I am fired up about, that shouldn't even compare, honestly, guys. It just shouldn't even compare. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm guilty too. I'm guilty of the same thing, that if something's around long enough, you just kind of go, oh, okay, huh, yeah. I don't want to get in the middle of all that. It's political. Come on, you know, come on. Masks are a lot more political than abortion. Amen. That's, uh, this is just killing people. So anyway, I said there's a lot of talk about this. If you pull up the next slide, it's just the second only to saving souls. The second only to the saving of souls should be the saving of babies. It really is that simple, I think. I believe it's just, you know, obviously the first thing is that people will be saved in the name of the Lord. But we were talking about how many opportunities there are to witness in this. People do talk to you. You go down there and, they, and people talk to you. They'll, they'll, actually, I was talking to a mayor of somewhere. I wish I'd asked him what he, where he was mayor because I'd like to continue the conversation a little bit. But, you know, he came and asked good questions. You know, that's good questions. There are people that will, and you have a chance to share about the Lord, which, you know, all of our, like the speech we just gave, it's about the Lord. It really is. One lady who was one of the legislative people, she started crying. We actually have a video of, uh, I think, did you take that video anyway? 
Yeah, and uh, I actually have a video of when I was speaking, and you can see her wipe tears out of her eyes, and she changed her vote to no. Um, and, uh, and she just thought it. So it's, it's, you can make a difference. There, is, there are things that do make a difference, and they aren't that hard to do. So um, anyway, when I think about Laodicea, I think about that, because he says, are you hot or cold? Guys, if we're hot, we'll actually care about those things. And I don't think we're cold because we talk about Jesus, and we come together and we worship him. I'm just afraid that maybe we're lukewarm. <laughs> That's my fear. My fear is that we could be lukewarm. And, uh, and I just don't want to be that. And I'm not saying that this is the only issue. I mean, I, I would say the same thing, that people are, are uh, more upset about masks than they are about the fact that their neighbor is going to hell. Well, we should be telling them about Jesus. I mean, there's just a lot of things that our passion is just mixed up on. It's just not there. If I could somehow, I, and not saying this is right, but if there was some trick where if I gave up all my gun rights, abortion as we know it would end... I'd say, okay. Again, I'm a big gun guy. I come from Alaska. But the reality is there's no comparison. There is no comparison. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Are we hot or cold, or are we lukewarm? I've heard a lot of talk in our, this last year about everybody trying to decide what the hill is that they'll die on. You know, what hill? I'll die. This is the hill that I'll die on. Well, there's a lot of good hills to die on, actually. There's no hill better than the name of Jesus Christ. There's no hill after that better than to save the children. Not a political thing, guys. So, there's a, um, that scripture in Laodicea should be pretty powerful to all of us, guys, because, um, you know, it says all the stuff. It says all the stuff about chasing after riches and chasing after the world and all that thing. You have all these things and you say, I am rich and I am blessed and I'm doing great. That's kind of like people boasting, you know, about freedom. Remember, remember the time when everybody in America used to boast about freedom? I remember when Greg Peterson came from Canada and we were building some stuff. We had to get 25,000 permits for building the RV park out there. <laughs> And he just looked at me and said, man, your country has given, done an amazing job at giving you an illusion of freedom. <laughs> I, just went, I thought about it, I went, huh. Well, it's become a little more evident in our recent times. Uh, we see that. But the thing is, we got to open our eyes, guys. We just got to open our eyes. And maybe some of the things that don't appall us anymore, they need to appall us. They need to make us angry. They need to get us upset. He stands at the door and he knocks. He stands at the door of the church and he knocks. And maybe many of us need to repent today. I have recently, because I realized that, yeah, I just got to going through the motions, you know. Get to, you know, I'm a guy that gets to teach a couple times a week and play some worship music, talk to people all over here in Canada about this, that, and the other, and the Lord. Um, and it's pretty easy to just go, oh, yeah, I'm doing my thing for Jesus, you know. And then you get down there and you see and you think about what's really happening in this world and you just go, man, it is an abomination to the Lord. 